In the beginning, there was nothing. Infinite nothing. Then that infinite nothing split into a symmetry, plus one and minus one, a never-ending array of matter-antimatter pairs, and the space-time that contained both. And for a split moment, t equals zero, the universe was perfect, completely ordered. But then, a fraction of a second later, at t equals one, quantum randomness took over, and the universe began to take shape. This particle over here ran into its antiparticle. And over here, and here, and so on. At t equals one, the first generation of matter-antimatter annihilation began. Those annihilations pushed nearby particles to also collide with their opposites, and a chain reaction was set off. This annihilation period would not only detonate all but one billionth of the original particles, it would start the expansion of space that goes on today. That expansion opened up the supervoids, vast stretches of emptiness, and it shoved the remaining matter into the galactic filaments that we see today, beginning the formation of stars, black holes, and galaxies. Maybe. The standard model of cosmology claims that space-time is expanding uniformly everywhere at once. But that's not what the universe looks like. This is a large-scale simulation of the universal structure that exists all around us today. This is not speculation, this is observation. As far as astronomers can tell, this bubble-like pattern of filaments and voids is the structure of all matter and all space-time, everywhere. Of course, appearances aren't everything. But it sure looks to me like the space-time here, and here, and here, expanded more than the space-time over here, in the filaments. In fact, it looks as if the space-time here expanded almost spherically, perhaps actually shoveling matter in front of it, in order to move all that matter from the void into where it is now. You can see how an expansion here, and another simultaneous expansion here, could capture all the matter in between, forming the filaments. To me, the large-scale structure of the universe looks like lots and lots of bubbles of space-time expanding, pushing matter out of the voids and into the filaments. So, what could possibly do that? What kind of early universe catastrophic event could possibly cause bubbles of space-time to expand like that? The cosmic microwave background is the afterglow of an early era of catastrophic matter-antimatter annihilation. According to the standard model, all but one billionth of all matter and presumably all antimatter was immediately destroyed, converted into pure energy. That would be like a billion times our current universe's matter, all converted into pure energy. Perhaps those detonations helped open up the voids, started the expansion that continues today, and swept matter into the filaments. The Big Bang is often incorrectly visualized as if it were an explosion out from a point. But cosmologists all agree that there was no center to the Big Bang. The Big Bang happened everywhere at once. According to the standard model, at t equals zero, the universe just suddenly appeared. All matter and antimatter and the space-time that contains both. All at once, everywhere, infinitely. Before t equals zero, there was nothing. No energy, no mass, no space, no time. But somehow nothing gave rise to infinite everything. Within infinite space-time, at t equals zero, it was the same infinite universe as we have now, just a much, much smaller infinity, and filled with a billion times more stuff. And we have every reason to believe that the universe began at maximal order. So, what might happen next? At t equals one, time essentially begins. 
And with time comes quantum indeterminacy. Things can change. And more importantly, the inevitable self-annihilation of matter with antimatter doesn't have to happen all at once. Here, in this arbitrary quadrant of space, we find that this arbitrary particle pair, which we'll call Fred and Wilma, is one of the first to collide and self-annihilate. In the exact same time slice, simultaneous to Fred and Wilma, but hundreds or billions of light years away, we see this other pair, Barney and Betty, which are also colliding and detonating. If we step back from local space and look at a wider swath of the early universe, we see a very small percentage of all particle pairs far flung from each other, all detonate by chance within that very first time slice. I propose that those first random pairs, because of their explosive power, exerted an important influence on the subsequent evolution of the universe. If we then move to the second arbitrary time slice after zero, we find that Fred and Wilma's blast pushes the nearby matter and antimatter away from its center. This causes more particle pairs to meet and mutually annihilate. Those newly exploded pairs will create their own shock waves, perturbing more material around them and causing more collisions, a chain reaction. Because the first blast from Fred and Wilma was spherical and thus influenced particles at all points around that sphere, which themselves exploded in spherical blasts, the cumulative chain reaction is roughly speaking spherical in effect. Elsewhere in the universe, where the shock waves have not yet affected the local particles, random probabilistic collisions continue to happen during time slice two and three and so on. But Fred and Wilma and similar time one blasts are already shaping the evolution of the universe going forward. Further out from the blast centers, we see a lot more material that the shock waves push outward on their leading wave. The chain reaction blast waves push matter and antimatter in an expanding particle bubble. Eventually, the expanding particle bubble from Fred and Wilma's chain reaction smashes into the expanding particle bubble from Barney and Betty. Whereas previously, the particles were being pushed spherically outward, when different spheres meet, their shock waves roughly cancel each other out, and all the surviving particles are now on the boundary line between the early shock waves. Not just the rubbles and the Flintstones, from all sides, other shockwave-driven bubbles smash their material into each other as well. This happens all over the infinite universe. Shockwaves driving bubbles of material to smash into the expanding bubbles of material from neighboring shockwaves. This collision of particles from the various spherical shockwaves then cause many distinct features of the universe which we can see around us today. First, a great deal of the colliding material will include further collisions between matter and antimatter, causing a second annihilation period and a third and so on. This will lead to the creation of smaller voids and bubbles which we still see around us today, which might explain why the void and filament structure exists on all these different scales. The largest scales could be the first generation of annihilations and the smaller scales result from the subsequent generations, blast waves upon blast waves. Second, at the boundary point between blast waves, some matter will, by chance, never run into antimatter and vice versa. It's just the way probability works. This will create long, thin islands of matter or antimatter, which eventually condense into galaxies, clusters, and superclusters. These long, thin islands of galaxies form the web-like filament structure that defines the universe as we see it today. Because the space is already expanding between matter clusters and antimatter clusters, therefore the distance between the two is always expanding, and we will never witness a matter galaxy collide with an antimatter one. Quantum randomness insists that at some places in these particle islands, the collisions will be fairly light, while others would be extremely dense. In the densest areas, the amount of material and the speed of collisions should lead directly to thermonuclear detonation. Those might skip right past the star stage and go straight to supernova. If we were around to witness the collision of the various blast wave bubbles, we would see all along the new filaments a chain of thermonuclear explosions as the densest nodes explode under pressure. 
These supernovae would seed the surrounding material with heavier atoms, creating the first material that could form into rocky planets. After the supernovae, those densest regions of colliding matter would then immediately collapse into spinning supermassive black holes. Those spinning supermassive black holes thereafter shape the movement of gas and dust around them, sculpting the nearby matter into galaxies. This would explain why we observe galaxies form much earlier than the standard model predicts, because the filaments were created not by slow gravity, but by a rapid annihilation period, forcing matter together. And it would explain why we don't observe black holes growing from stellar mass size to supermassive, because all the supermassive black holes were formed not from slow accretion, but rather from this early catastrophic event. And it explains why there is anything at all because uniform expansion of space should have isolated all material from each other at the very beginning, leaving the universe without structure, just a fine mist of rarefied particles. Hopefully, this story gives a plausible account of why there are voids and how the filaments came together. But I'm sure you have questions, like how could a matter-antimatter annihilation cause the expansion of space? What about the singularity or the Hubble constant? What about dark matter and dark energy? And why did the big event happen in the first place? To answer those questions, I'm going to have to go into some deeper speculation about space-time and the nature of nothingness. So I'm going to save that for the next video. I hope you join me there.